Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Abdul, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, Designing for the AODA, Today and Tomorrow. The RGD is a nonprofit professional association supporting the graphic design community. We hold weekly webinars free for all members, and you can find details at rgd.ca slash webinars. Please consider joining RGD to connect with fellow designers, access resources, demonstrate professionalism, and support the community. And you can find details at rgd.ca slash join. And our presenter today is Adam Spencer, who is the president of AbleDocs. Adam has been a global leader in the document accessibility field for over 10 years. He specializes in PDF accessibility, accessibility standards, document usability by adaptive technology users. Adam is also the vice chair of the Standards Council of Canada, responsible for the authoring of the ISO standards for PDF and PDF accessibility. Adam volunteers on several accessibility advisory committees, as well as speaking at conferences around the world, sharing experiences and, exp and expertise. So before we begin, we have a few reminders. If you have any questions, please submit them using the questions tab in the webinar control panel. Questions do take a while to come through the system, so please make sure to ask any questions you have during the presentation. Questions submitted will be answered at the end of the talk. We also invite you to interact with us on Twitter by tweeting during and after the broadcast using the hashtag RGDWeb. So welcome everyone, and thank you for coming. If you're ready, Adam, I will turn it over to you, and I just sent you the webcam request. I am ready and I have accepted that request. So hopefully Amazing. you and everyone else can see me. Yeah, we can see you and we can see the slides whenever you're ready. Fantastic. Well, thanks everyone. It's always, uh, I, I have found it tremendously awkward these past eight months or nine months, I guess, uh, to be able to deliver these sessions without seeing you or interacting. Um, and I know that we've had a tremendous number of questions come in before the session, which is just fantastic. And in response, uh, I, I always like to have these sessions as interactive. So. I'm going to burn through my slides as, as quickly as possible. Um, and please feel free to ask as many questions as you'd like. I want to make sure that we've got enough time at the end to answer them because it is still one of those burning questions. What do we do for the AODA requirements, either for us or for our clients? And, you know, we've always had a very special relationship with graphic designers and specifically the RGD and um, wanting to make sure that as we move into the next phase of, of the AODA, uh, which is, is finally upon us, we're going to be able to find the answers going forward because as much as, as the legislation has stayed the same, the landscape has changed, the expectations have changed, and I really want to make sure that, that you are armed with as much information as possible to help as, as many uh, people that, that you're touching in, in, with your work are able to consume your content. So, welcome to designing for the AODA. Uh, I always like to pretend that there's an audience, so I'm assuming you're all slouched in seats and uh, got a cup of coffee and we're ready to roll. I, I think it's still too early. Yeah, it's a cup of coffee at this point. So, let's start with, with some fundamentals. Accessibility, who cares? You know, when, when I got into the industry 12 years ago now, a lot of that question came down to when is accessibility going to matter and become a normal part of our conversation? And the funny thing is, you know, we are 29 days away from what was supposed to be our original compliance deadline. Um, and that, that has shifted out and we'll talk about it. But I'm still getting asked on a daily basis, did you know that the AODA is, uh, is here at December 31st? And, and the answer is obviously I do. Um, but shockingly, why, why didn't you? Um, and, and we're really still in that education phase that even though we've got uh, so many years behind us, I mean, the AODA was written 15 years ago or passed 15 years ago, we all still play a part in ensuring that, that we're creating an accessible Ontario. And now with the Accessible Canada Act, because um, I'm sure many of you are, are creating content for across the country, we build content thinking about accessibility and we have to think about it from the, the start. If we're being reactive, it's too late. It's not that we can't do anything about it, but we're now fixing problems rather than tackling those problems in the first place. So the history of the AODA. As I mentioned, the, the law was passed in 2005. Uh, the information and communication standard was ratified in 2012. 
And quite frankly, when when there was a conversation internally at Able Docs earlier this year when when COVID hit, and it was, are we really going to still need to ensure compliance by December 31st? And I po I posed that question to a number of colleagues, and and we all kind of laughed at each other, like, what does COVID have to do with this? We've been working on this since for the last eight years. Why are we still having the conversation of a compliance deadline being shifted? And it's it's funny to think for those of us in the industry that this is still a conversation that we're having. It's understandable though. And, and I don't want you to feel down on yourself for thinking, well, I'm just hearing about this or I'm just getting into it. It's a continuum. And, and if you haven't been touched by accessibility or maybe your clientele are only employing 20 people, uh, rather than 50 or or being a government agency that we've had to deal with this for, for quite some time. The accessibility world very much becomes a bubble. You know, we think that accessibility should just be a basic fundamental thing with every piece of content being created accessibly from the start. But the reality is we have a lot of people within the province and and elsewhere that this is reactive. You know, the whole goal of the AODA was to be proactive when it came to accessible content. And one thing that we've seen accelerate because of COVID is the need for digital content to be accessible and move quite quickly. So you really need to come in with a strategy to ensure your content's accessible from the start. So what are we aiming towards? Well, the whole goal of the AODA is to ensure that as content is created and distributed, it is fully accessible, not reactive like someone creates a complaint or someone requests a file be accessible. The idea is the document is accessible at the time of distribution. So if you are emailing a PDF, if you are loading a document to the website, if you are loading a, a new piece of web content, Anything you're doing to communicate to the public or to, as, an, as your organization is reaching out to your clients, that content must be accessible. At this point, internal content is not required for all. That is coming, so be prepared and, and talk to your clients, educate your clients. That's a lot of what this is about. It's, it's about having the conversation saying, you do realize that if you don't make your content accessible today, it is just going to have to be made accessible tomorrow. And there's no changing this. And I know there are a couple of questions about enforcement and there's questions about what are my real obligations. And the reality is this is no longer a conversation that we should be having. Your content's accessible, that's it. And you know, I've had conversations with people like, well, I'm gonna fire two people from my organization so I don't have to meet the needs of, of the AODA. It's like, one, that's absurd. Two, if you're questioning you know, whether this is a, just an added cost, you're not recognizing how people interact with content. You're also not realizing that the things that you do for accessibility makes your content that much more approachable, distributable, reusable, so we can see it on different devices. If we make content accessible, it's the whole concept between reflow of a website. You know, we've got reactive sites that look differently on phones and tablets and uh, full screen devices. Documents are the same, right? So we're seeing that better design leads to better accessibility and it's better code, it's cleaner, it's easier to use. We don't rely on these kind of cheap workarounds. Um, and, and I know some of us always like to, to try and find the fastest way to do something but ultimately it's going to really cut you at the knees because you're going to have to rework something that if you had thought about it at the beginning, your process towards accessibility would be that much faster. I wanna clear a couple of things up between technologies before we move a little further forward. WCAG and PDF, okay? So WCAG is the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. PDF UA, is the standard for documents. If you have read the uh, AODA legislation, section 14, which pertains to digital content, it indicates that all web content must be compliant to WCAG 2.0 AA. Now, let's, let's stay on WCAG for a second. WCAG has updated. Technology moves faster than legislation. 
And we have seen an update uh, of the WCAG standard or WCAG guidelines uh, that was ratified and implemented earlier this year, which is very exciting. Please take a deep breath, don't panic, and think that this is now going to be infinitely more expensive for you to have an accessible website. It isn't. The only thing that has changed is the internet. And what WCAG 2.1 is looking to do is make sure that the accessibility guidelines adapt to the latest web technologies. Remember when we were all designing in Flash and then we realized, wow, that's terrible. And from an accessibility standpoint, it's even worse. Okay, well, why would we have guidance for Flash when Flash has basically been abandoned, right? Things change. Legislation is slow to change. And you've got to realize that when the, the in section 14, it identifies applicable standards and applicable guidelines to a given technology. How can I make Braille accessible in a WCAG compliance guideline? I can't, it's impossible, but it's got its own requirements. It complies to BANA or the uh, Braille, Associate, uh, um, Braille Authority of North America. When you've got those applicable technologies, you have to apply them correctly. So we get asked on a daily basis, my PDF needs to be WCAG compliant. Okay, one, it can't be. You can't be compliant to a guideline. WCAG is built as a series of, of recommendations for a given piece of content. If you encounter this, you should have that. Whereas PDF UA is a very prescriptive standard and applies specifically to PDF documents. So when we get asked, can this be WCAG compliant? Yes, because the standards are complementary. They have, oops, press the wrong button there, sorry. There are no conflicts between WCAG and PDF UA, none. What happens is we apply PDF specs to PDFs and we apply web content specs to web content. A PDF never needs to be web content. I can create a PDF today, put it on a USB key, provide it to my friend next door, and it will never hit the internet. This is one of the challenges that we've seen with the writing of legislation. And we've even heard clients try to skirt the legislation saying, well, we're not distributing it on the web, so we don't need to do it. But you're still distributing it. Just remember, your testing tools are testing for PDF UA. Know the difference between the capabilities of the testing tools. Adobe Acrobat's accessibility checker is not compliant with any of the specifications. It is not fully WCAG compliant, it is not PDF UA compliant, and I know PD, uh, that Adobe is the biggest name in PDF. It is not their technology, it's an ISO standard, it's publicly available. I'm a contributing author, we have 10 other contributing authors in the company. We're looking at this holistically because PDF does things that websites don't do and websites do things that PDFs don't do. Things like media, actions, scripting, design, content considerations. But keep in mind, we can add those things in as additional pieces. So if your file has a video, why wouldn't you caption it, right? It's not a PDF UA requirement, but it's a WCAG requirement. PDF UA is, is content agnostic. Our job is to make the, the content accessible based on what we're given, whereas we can absolutely follow things like a color contrast requirement, part of WCAG, not part of PDF UA. We're never going to sit there and say, wow, this document's completely inaccessible. It's differently accessible. And there's a reason why that those, those differences exist. And I won't go into that today because this isn't just about document accessibility, this is designing for. Uh, but I, I really want to just stress, one, the AODA has reinforced that PDF is a completely valid format for accessibility and distribution of content within the province, full stop. Um, so if that's the case, then we need to ensure that it's accessible. Oh, I went back a slide, sorry. So why are we still talking about PDF? And I get asked this all the time and all of my web uh, design friends say, you know, PDF is dead. and uh, PDF should have been dead years ago, and I'm tired of talking about documents. Look at all the cool things that I can do on the web. You're right. The, the web is a really cool place. But many of you on this call design reports and documents for agencies around the world 
And how do they ask for it? A PDF. Nobody's going to read a 300 page report in HTML. It's not gonna happen. And then you'll ask about EPUB, I'm sure. What about EPUB? It's easy. It, 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 it is if you know what you're doing and so is PDF if you know what you're doing. The reality is people don't read EPUB. It's not a consumed thing outside of education. So we're looking at distribution models and we're looking at how people expect to receive content. We all still uh, vi visually expect to receive content in a certain way, laid out on a page, concept of what is a page. Those, those conversations are a part of it. So to deny the fact that all content needs to be accessible is a little short-sighted. Um, there are ways around it. Yes, you can provide a plain text version of content. We know that there's a, a few ministries in the province that provide content in HTML, PDF, Word, real text, and plain text, which is absurd. There is absolutely no need for that whatsoever. A PDF can be just as accessible as a web page and a web page just as accessible as a PDF. You need to know what you're doing. So we're still talking about it because PDF technology predates the internet um, as we know it today. There are over a billion PDFs loaded to the internet annually, and that does not include PDFs loaded behind firewalls. PDF has been built upon a platform of trust. So we know that the content is identical. We can archive it. We can have a distribution model that is different. We know that when that document was created and I look at it five years later, it's the exact same piece of content. The technology doesn't change because it's all backwards compatible. We can't say that about the web. Browser support changes. All PDF going forward must go back to allow a PDF 1.0 file to work. It is a fundamental key of what we do in, in PDF. So um, again, what's UA and why it matters? PDF UA is an ISO standard. We've got a new one coming out. It's globally recognized and ratified by countries around the world. And all the testing tools test against WCAG, or sorry, test against PDF UA, not WCAG, whether you knew it or not. So remember, I know you're going to be asked for WCAG, and that's okay. But recognize that your testing tools all test against PDF UA. There's a new checker coming out for any of you who've used PAC. Um, there's a new version of PAC that will include a color contrast check. Uh, but, but other than contrast, uh, there's really no major difference between them. We're looking at universal accessibility, and, and that's what it stands for. It's a normative technical standard. It provides consistent guidance, and it's an additive spec to what a good PDF is. And for most of you coming out of InDesign, your next step is likely to PDF. PDF is not web content. It can be, but is not always. And that's a big, important part. And what we're really focused on is the author. We're focused about you, the designer. I never want to be in a position where I come, I get a call and say, you've got to change your design. It's our job to take your design and make it accessible. There is a technique for making every single piece of content on that page fully accessible. It may be through a different tag structure. It may be through a different um, uh, uh, object element. We have ways of doing that, but you've got to recognize that there's a way to do it and what those limitations can be coming out of applications like InDesign, like Publisher, like Quark, because I still can't believe we get those files, um, and Word and PowerPoint and Excel. There are, there, are, uh, there are pieces that are still missing in that creation point and it's up to you to know what those pieces are. And if you don't, please ask. The number of times we get calls saying, my designer did this and they said it's accessible. And I look at it and it's completely untagged. And, and just, I, I don't want to go too far ahead, but I'm hoping everyone knows what a tag is, the, the structure that we put all of our content into to identify that to a user. Um, but we're, we're trying to, to continuously educate and I am flabbergasted that in 2020, we are still seeing content authors and designers claim that they can make something accessible and then provide an, a completely inaccessible document. If any of you are doing that, please stop. Just ask for help. Uh, that's not a knock on you. 
recognize that accessibility may be a step that, that could cost a little more. So ask people in the beginning and they can provide you with that help. Don't just go for your cheapest option and farm it offshore for you know a dollar a page. You're not going to get what you need. You may think you will, but you won't. And it's really easy because we've been doing this for so long and accessibility in the province has existed for so long. It's really easy to test whether it's accessible or not. And yes, you can spoof a checker, but we can also see that really easily as well. So you're not, you're not really spoofing anyone. And I will tell you from a sales standpoint for you as a designer, knowing your approach for accessibility is going to be one of the fundamental differentiators for you in a sink or swim reality. You either make the content accessible or not. And that doesn't mean you have to do it, but you have to have a way of, of, of providing that to your end client because this isn't going away. When we hit June 30th at, at midnight, the accessibility problem or challenge is not gone. We still create more content. All of that content needs to be made accessible. This is, this is just the way that it works. And, and as hard as teams are working to try and eliminate the need for things like remediation services and provide better tool sets to make things more accessible, we're still not there yet. And, and you know, I bluntly thought uh, naively that I'd be out of business 10 years ago, um, but we're not. And, and we're, we're trying, we're trying to make this step obsolete, but it takes time and, and we're seeing big improvement in the way that we get there. Like we can go from Word to fully accessible and compliant PDF in one click. From InDesign, we can get almost 95% of the way there, but you need other tools to do it. And, and it's the same thing with fonts, right? If you want to have a great looking font, sometimes you may have to invest in that font and, and potentially pass that cost off to the client. But in, in where we are now, people know that Accessibility is very much like language translation. And, and all we're doing is translating it instead of to French, we're translating it for someone who can't visually consume content. We're talking the, the language of accessibility now. And it, it really provides a, a new opportunity for us to reshape how content is provided, distributed and consumed by everyone. So what's good enough? I get this question all the time. Adam, uh, it passes this checker. Okay, well, have you confirmed that those headings make sense? No, but it passes the checker. Okay, but that's not the point, right? The point is to allow a user who has a, a, a challenge visually consuming content. So whether that's a loss of sight, a visual impairment, a cognitive disability, any of those types of challenges that that we can have with visually consuming content has to still effectively convey the exact same content to a user. That includes things like heading structures, that includes tables, that includes lists and links and, and all of the elements that you're putting on a page that have meaning and, and uh, have, have weight behind them have to be accessible. This isn't about reading someone text. Let's Let's be very clear. When, when I get asked on a daily basis, I feel, I, I tried to read the file in Adobe Read Out Loud. Okay, that's great. It's not a screen reader. It doesn't consume the tag structure the way that a real screen reader like JAWS or NVDA or VoiceOver would. So we often see in the cited community, I heard it, so it's got to be good enough. Well, let me tell you, good enough is no longer good enough. Your content needs to be conveyed to every user in an equal manner. That doesn't mean the same way. It means an equal way. A heading is a heading is a heading. A list is a list is a list. A table is a table is a table. We have to convey that type of experience to a user who isn't going to visually consume that content in a traditional sense and or in a cited context. And, and that's what the whole point is. Now, you've also got to remember that there's so many other advantages for doing this. You've got a better representation on mobile. Adobe just released a new mode in their mobile uh, viewers called Liquid Mode, and it reflows all of the content. And if the pages are tagged properly, they work so much better in a mobile context. 
So the old argument that you can't read a PDF on a mobile device is moot. Move on. Get a new argument. We're, it's, it's, we're past that. We're also past the fact that PDFs aren't as accessible as websites. Nonsense. They are. You don't need to simplify tables. You don't need to strip out great design. What we and and I know there's a question. Uh, there was a, a question that was submitted earlier about black text on a white background. Black text on a white background is actually horrendously inaccessible for some people with print disabilities because the the glare from the white background is too much. It hurts them to read. So this this sense that there's one accessible option for design is is not true at all. It's about how you overcome what you've put on a page to ensure that it's accessible and machine readable. How do we get through this? So for example, this slide is a flat image. I know that this is a, a, I think it's a PNG, and that text good enough is no longer good enough is flattened on the image. Well, we need to make that text live. So we could OCR this page, or we could provide it as an alt text description and allow a user to still know that the content on this slide is yes, shark circling a bullseye with a guy parachuting out of the sky. That's just a visual cue. It doesn't actually provide any meaningful content, but the good enough is no longer good enough is the important part on that, on that piece. And we've got to convey that to a user. So I, I know there are a bunch of specific questions and, and I know I've been speaking for almost half an hour, and I want to get to those questions because my hope is that it will also help answer some others that I'm, I'm sure have come in as I've spoken so far. So am I accessible? I am accessible. And, and I cannot stress enough, we have a compliance deadline of now June 30th. Don't wait. Don't hesitate. Add in accessibility as part of your offering to either your business or your client and just make it part of your practice. Again, it doesn't need it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to become that expert because I'm guessing most of you didn't run out and learn French when the French language laws came in. But at least ask the right people. Ask the question. You know, we at, at, at AbleDocs, we love to talk about this stuff. Some would argue I talk too much about it. Some also question why am I still talking about it? But I love this. And and when when we're looking at solving those questions. I still see people who I spoke to 10 years ago claiming that they're making content accessible and they aren't. And all they would have to do, what do I do with this piece of content? What should I do? Okay, well, let's, let's tell you, let's help you. And, and that's not a sales pitch. It's, it's an, a, an offering saying, send an email. It doesn't cost anything to send an email. And, and our, our whole, point of being here is to make sure that content is accessible because every time we put up an additional barrier we we now have to fix that problem later on and nobody wants to see that so i'll leave this slide up obviously with our full contact info and and please at any time feel free to reach out um, whether that's through our website or, or through email or on linkedin or twitter we are always happy to answer your questions and uh, I think that's a, a pretty good transition, Abdul, uh, straight into let's start hammering through these questions because I know there's a lot. Amazing. Yeah, we do have a lot of questions. Um, all right. So we'll start off with one of the questions that just came through from Jenny. Uh, Jenny asks, for the upcoming web content deadline, are intranets included? No. No, intranets do not start to have a requirement until 2022. Now, that depends on the size of your organization, but I will say this. Start working on your intranets now. One of the challenges that uh, organizations will have, and we're seeing this right now with public-facing content, for whatever reason, we have not figured out unlimited budgets. We're still working on it. We're putting our best people on the job. But all of a sudden, we're seeing, you know, with six months to go before a deadline, people are in a panic to try and find money. If you start working today on getting your intranet accessible, you're then reducing the amount of funds that you have to put aside in the future. If you start eating through that content, just chip away at it, even if it's not all of it. Put a budget together, start working through it, because by the time the deadline hits, you're then not having to deal with a mountain of content 
you're having to deal with the new processes as part of your uh, as part of your your internal organization. Perfect. And our next question is, uh, what should you consider when you first set up your files or start working on a project, and it needs to be AODA compliant? It's a bit of a loaded question. Um, so I will I will try to broad stroke, and if I've missed something specific for you, please add it in to the question afterwards. One, who's consuming this? How is it being distributed? How are you planning on creating this content? Are you planning on trying to create as most as much of an accessible document as possible, or are you planning on using a service to do it after the fact? What tools do you have? Do those tools do what you think they do? Are you getting accessible content after the fact? And is this a sustainable approach for you? How often will that document be updated? What volume is that document being created in? Is it a one-off or is it used multiple times? Because there isn't one solution for every document type. And that's a really important thing. We got a question the other day. Hi, we have 90,000 documents. Okay, are they all the same or different? If they're all the same, then you've got one document and we have a totally different process. So making sure that you've you've structured that correctly, you're creating things, if, if we're working in InDesign, you're creating a, uh, a comprehensive reading order, you're creating articles, you're creating a consistency with your heading structures and your design. You're not kind of uh, to, to uh, I guess, steal something from Hitch. You're not out here doing something with your design. You're following that logical uh, reuse of design within the document to make it easier for you to make that accessible. So those are kind of your, your top tips. Awesome. And our next question is from Kelsey, and Kelsey asks, um, are PDFs sent through email to the public subject to the AODA laws in the new year? In the new year? Sorry. Yes. Any distributed content. And what is the largest mis mistake you find designers make while designing for accessibility? Well, <laughs> that depends. Um, I would say the overarching statement is the expectation that InDesign is going to do everything for you or any application is going to do everything for you. So let's be very clear. Adobe Acrobat is 100% capable of making an accessible PDF, not generating an accessible PDF, but fixing all of the things that may be missing. InDesign can't. The best you could probably hope for is around 70%. And that becomes a huge challenge. You know, how are you going to tackle that that remaining 30? And it goes back to that is good enough, good enough. And and the answer is obviously no. So you really need to understand where your limitations are. And I think that from a technology standpoint, I think that's really the heart of the biggest mistake that we see over and over again. I was told that it's accessible. I watched a YouTube video and it said that if I just do the following five things, my document's accessible. First of all, that's not what those YouTube videos have told you. We see them all the time. <laughs> There's much more to it. They're trying to, even the training courses that are, are mostly available, they're trying to shoehorn you into make a simple table, use simple lists, use simple structure, and then you're accessible. And that's not true. I mean, I I, I know we've, we've, many of us have uh, met before and that that conference in what was that 2010 um which was only use ariel and verdana and the panic sets through the room and it's like that's not true like stop believing that there's there's a whole lot of additional um consideration that can go into your design and and be creative with it just know how to overcome those potential limitations with the export and our next question is, uh, is there an AODA certification for designers? No, that does not exist. And and I will say, you know, uh, we get asked all the time about the IAAP certification. Does this now mean I'm the best? No. Um, there really isn't a, a way to certify whether you are compliant with your skill set. It's going to come out in the file. Um, 
there are definitely there are definitely opportunities for you to hone your skill through training with advanced level training uh, but there isn't a, a piece of paper like every time I see someone put up that they've they've passed a test from the IAAP great that that's not a bad thing but that doesn't mean you know everything there is to know about making a document accessible uh, so just again ask the questions about what will I get at the end of the day and and ask the hard ones if I'm creating something with transparency masks um, and, and gradient, do I know how to tackle that in accessibility? And someone's going to say, tag it as a figure. Okay, but is it? And, and a lot of that is judgment and, and recognizing how content is going to be consumed. And our next question is, uh, when considering color and contrast in design, is black and white the best option for optimum contrast for visual impairment? So I, I did touch on this earlier. The answer is no. Um, Color-wise, I mean, uh, many of you may have heard the, the kind of golden ratio of four and a half to one. And what does that mean? Well, the foreground color is four and a half times darker than the, the background color or, or vice versa. You've got an inverse relationship of four and a half to one. And there are free tools available. Color Contrast Analyzer from the Passiello Group, one of my favorites. Um, I find it really easy. But color contrast is an interesting one because you don't know if someone has a color deficiency. But if you make your document accessible, tag all of your text, even Acrobat and Reader have the ability to change the viewing color that's presented in like three clicks. And if you have a, a print disability that impairs your, your ability to pick up color or black text on a white background is harsh for, for your macular degeneration, or um, you are able to change that relationship of the text colors so it's easier for you to read. And that's why we're making the content accessible. If I have a flat image, I can't change anything in that image, right? So if you have text in an image that is a low color, um, a, a low contrast ratio, it's going to be very difficult for that person to read. But if it's text, and I can change that on my viewing, then I'm going to win every time. And, and we forget about the fact that someone with that kind of, of print disability, this isn't 20 years ago when everything was print, right? Even, even the, the underlying guidelines that people still go back to, and I really don't know why, but the clear print guidelines that were published if, Goodness, it's got to be 15 years ago now. There's a really key word, print. In a digital context, I can change my font size, my magnification, my color contrast, all of those things. If my document or website are accessible, the variability that I have to customize my reading experience is infinite. And, and no one is going to tell us how we consume content. What works for you may not work for me. And what works for me may not work for a thousand other people. Um, my preference, you know, when, when I'm in the office, I have four big screens. But when I'm on the road, I'm on a 12-inch laptop with incredibly small, small, small font. If anyone on my team is on this call, they can barely read my, my screen. Uh, but that's my preference. And we have scalability. What, we don't use things like point size anymore when we're designing digital content. It's relative, right? My heading is going to be 2M larger than, than my body text. And that allows the viewer, whether it's a web browser or um, uh, a PDF reader, to scale and, and provide us with a great reading experience that works for us. So no, please be a great designer. That's why you're part of this call. You're a great designer. You've decided to commit to making the world a better designed place. Design great documents, because for 90% of the population, that's how it's going to be consumed. But for the 10%, when we make that accessible, like you've got to remember, that's over 3 million Canadians are going to access your content differently. That's a huge number. So you can't ignore the fact that as we get older and as, as things change uh, with our, our visual abilities, we're going to look at consuming content differently. And we expect everything to be digital. It's not like our grandparents 
mean, my grandmother still doesn't have a computer. Um, it's it's a very different world for for an aging population than it than it was ten years ago. And our next question is from James, and James asks, uh, if the checker in Acrobat isn't compliant, what tool or tools are available to properly check these things? I know a lot of people in my organization don't know about AODA compliance, so anything that eases that burden would be helpful. Great question, James. So from a free standpoint, the best two free checkers will be PAC, so the PDF Accessibility Checker. It's currently in version three. There's a new version coming out in January uh, called PAC 2021. Brilliant, uh, didn't see that one coming. But it's arguably the most used checker in the world. Uh, or sorry, not arguably, it is the most used checker in the world. It is used by the province. It is validated uh, to be completely PDF UA compliant. As I said, the new version is going to include color contrast checking. Uh, and the other big free tool uh, would be Common Looks Checker. Um, again, you you are the cool thing about where we are today. Choose a tool that works for you. Um, but if if it was me, I would be using Pack. Uh, if you were paying for a tool where you wanted to do other things to the file, and and I'm not trying to be salesy or anything, but from a validation standpoint, Access PDF is is your best option. Uh, AXES PDF. It uses the same engine as PAC. Um, personally, I would never use Acrobat. Uh, and that's not a knock at Adobe. It's just, it, it isn't compliant. So it doesn't give you that granularity that you need to truly ensure that your file is accessible and compliant. Uh, our next question is, um, how would you make a JPEG that is uploaded to your website for download or for viewing online accessible? So there's nothing you can do to the image other than design it well. Uh, but when you're presenting it on the website, you have to add or embed an alt attribute. So you're going to have a text description that's associated with that image that allows a user to know what you've, con what you've put in that, that JPEG or a PNG or any other file format. Um, and the description needs to be concise it needs to be um, uh, accurate as to what's conveyed in the content. But that concise piece is really important because alt text cannot be navigated. Once you're into reading that alt, you're on a, on a ride. And, and a screen reader user is either going to listen to the whole thing or if they get bored, skip it. So that's why being concise with that, that alt is, is the best advice I could give there. And our next question is, um, our compliance officer is saying that the reporting deadline is, is extended to June 30th, that the websites need to still be compliant by January 1st. Is that true? Uh, that that seems, contra maybe I'm, I'm not hearing that correctly, but the, the statement seems contradictory. The answer is the deadline has been pushed to June 30th. That is true. Mm -hmm. However, you've had eight years to do this. And the ADO or the Accessibility Directorate of Ontario has been doing spot checking the whole way through. So whether you know it or not, organizations have been contacted by the ADO and said, look, you are a very public facing organization um, or you're still you know, six months away from compliance requirement and you're saying you're still not accessible, what's your plan? And the ADO is, is really focused on getting people to do the right thing. We are not, I say we, I, I, think, I think we're okay in saying that we're all here in Ontario. Um, we are not as litigious as our Southern brethren. Uh, so you're not likely going to be sued. You would be brought up against a tribunal, either the Human Rights Commission or a complaint filed with, with the ADO itself. But again, we, we see it with our clients, there's still this massive push to make sure that we're compliant or they're compliant by December 31st and then put a plan in for all of the net new content that's created. And depending on the size of your organization, I go back to the longer you wait, the worse this problem is going to be. So yes, the official compliance deadline is June 30th, but don't, don't wait until June 1st because it's not going to continuously be pushed out. There's no need to. 
and and those close to it are saying we shouldn't have pushed it out in the first place but here we are awesome and our next question is from jenny um are pack and common looks checkers available for back no not today um pack for mac will be coming out in q1 of 2021 I can't speak to common look that I don't know, but I, I do know that PAX plan is to have a Mac version. And that's another big thing. And I, I know this is a, a tough one to hear on, on a call with the RGD and, and I don't really know of any applications in accessibility that are built for Mac or, or primarily built for Mac. I mean, even the limitations coming out of word into PDF on Mac are worse than that in PC. Um, so, you know, you're going to need parallels likely for most of your tooling. Um, but it's, it's, the reality is most content is created within a PC environment. Um, I, I always get dirty looks for that, but that's, that's what the research shows. Uh, and, and that's where the development effort has been. But I, I do know PAC is coming for, for Mac. And do logo colors have to be accessible? <laughs> um, so the short answer is no, they don't have to be because you can tag a logo as a, as a figure, as an image and put an alt text description saying brand mark of Ableox. It would be very difficult to go to, and I'm not trying to, to name any specific names or call them out, but it's going to be pretty hard to go to McDonald's and say, we'd like you to shift all of your global branding to go away from the golden arches and red text. Uh, there's a couple of Canadian banks that are in the same, same position. There are workarounds and there's nothing wrong with a workaround. You've got to remember you're conveying the content in one means or another, not rebrand the entire organization to make sure you're accessible. So don't be in a panic. Um, you've got other ways of doing it. So if you're concerned about color contrast, that's great. You should be, but also know that there are other means of conveying that content and making that content still equally accessible. And our next question is from Dana. Uh, is there a big difference between Ontario standards for AODA versus Canada as a whole? No, they basically follow the same, uh, same guideline or same guidance, uh, biggest difference would be that the ACA was written last year um, rather than in, in 2012. So there's there's some updates that, that kind of better reflect where we are now with from a technology standpoint and take into account all of the things that we've learned from the AODA. I mean, one of the cool things about being from Ontario, we're trailblazers. We, we really set the bar for proactive accessibility but if you're making things and this is why there's a big difference between standards and legislation if you follow the standards you will always be able to comply with the legislation there's absolutely no nothing wrong with with that approach in fact most legislation around the world references the standards um, and i know you know people say well they, they've got uh, 32 points of, of compliance in WCAG for PDF, and they actually don't. It's not compliance, uh, it's a guideline. And now the W3C is going to be acknowledging the fact that PDF content needs to be PDF UA compliant. So as we see that shifting in, in technology, there is nothing stopping you from making something more appropriately accessible and by that i mean appropriate to the technology that you're using as, as technology continues to change you're always going to be accessible to something from before uh it's really the old content that becomes uh, part of the challenge but it's it's always grandfathered in so you don't have a problem with that but that that holds true globally there are some um legislated or not legislated um there are some custom requirements uh, like the Health and Human Services standard, it looks like the state of California, in case any of you design internationally, that will have specific guidance around certain types of content um, or, or mandate certain uh, content requirements. 
but again, it, it really doesn't make that big of an impact to you as a designer or, or you as someone who's making the content accessible. And our next question is, uh, is developing an accessible version and a creative version of the PDF for consumption a good solution where the user has the ability to choose or is it better to just do one accessible version for all? So, sorry, Abdul, you broke up there for a quick second. What, what was the start of that question? Uh, an accessible version and a creative version where the user has the uh, choice picking one. So uh, I will put on my, my uh, I guess it's my professional and personal hat. No, an accessible version is horrible. We're, that's the whole point of what we're doing here. Have a designed version that's accessible. And, and every time you provide an accessible quote unquote version, you are treating someone differently. The idea is that it's one piece of content for everyone. And I see these, these kind of quick and dirty workarounds that strip out all of the semantics, all of the richness of that, that design, all because the person didn't take the time to figure out how to make the content accessible, either doing it themselves or providing it to a service. There are hundreds of services. Um, there are some that are much better than others. But, but it's all available to you. And every time you create a quote unquote accessible version, you are still treating someone differently. And the whole point is that we are all the same. We may interact with things differently, but why should I have to request something? Why should I not have access to the full version? There's nothing you're designing that can't be made accessible. Full stop, everything you're doing can be accessible. So you've, you've really got to, to recognize that the whole idea is one document for everyone. And our next question is, uh, one of our clients we do a quarterly print publication for posts the, PDFs of, the PDF of these publications on their website. Do we need to go back and make any existing PDFs fully accessible? Yes. So the short answer is, if the content is available online and the website was updated, following 2012, which I have no idea how it wouldn't have been, all that content has to be accessible. If it is publicly consumable, it must be accessible. Now, there are certain ways that you can potentially minimize that exposure. Um, and the answer is not just remove all of the content. Also, don't panic with the amount of content that's there. And, and I get that next question all the time. It's, well, we have, tons of reports what should we do make them accessible and and it's likely not going to be as bad as you think if you're the type of organization or you're supporting an organization that has that kind of volume it means that they take that much time to create that content as well and this is what why i go back to if you're creating content on a regular basis make it accessible that intranet com, uh, uh, question earlier about we have content that's being created in the future. What should we do for the internet? Make it accessible now, because it will all have to be accessible down the road. So again, if your content is available for distribution or consumption, it has to be accessible. And our next question is from Vicky. Uh, what is the best way to work with an English accessible PDF that needs to be translated to French and you have a lot of alt text or descriptors? Do you send all this back and uh, and text to your translator? I'm not sure how to deal with it. Well, that's a great question, Vicky. Uh, so one, uh, you're going to have to design a French version anyways. So as part of that process, you're going to have an English version and a French version. Uh, never have a bilingual document. That's a, that's a big no, because reading a bilingual document is is not really effective. The technology doesn't exist to switch between the two languages independently. So it's it's a really messy solution. Not to mention if your client is required to post bilingual content or multilingual content, you're going to have an English site and a French site or a Spanish site or a German site or a whatever. And that content is going to be accessed from that that location. So when that content is being translated, absolutely include the alt text in the, in the request to the translator, have them translate it, and then insert the content into that, that specific language version. Um, both documents will have to be made accessible because uh, amazingly, you can have a print disability if you speak a different language. 
So all of that content needs to be accessible. And our next question is, uh, and I've got this question a lot today. Uh, what is the best training, videos, rain, uh, reading materials, et cetera, that you could recommend on this? <laughs> well, um, uh, don't want to be salesy, um, but if you contact us, we can we can definitely help you with that. From a reading standpoint, probably the best thing there too. Um, it's either going to be read the Matterhorn protocol for document accessibility. Um, uh, Karen McCall has a has a great book for years. Uh, there are pieces that are are I would suggest still need a little fine tuning. But from a fundamental standpoint, it, it's probably one of the best feet forward that you could take. Uh, from a training program, I'm, I'm absolutely going to plug ours. Uh, I think it's second to none. We take it from a position of kind of where do you start and where do you need to go, rather than this is how you tag a p-tag in Acrobat. You really need to tailor your, your um, training to what your workflow looks like. Um, like in InDesign, are you using the right tools? There are add-ons that can help you. Uh, and again, reach out to us and, and happy to provide that, that guidance. But you really need to understand the fundamentals of accessibility. Um, you need to understand where you're going. I mean, Dax Castro is fantastic. Uh, he, he does a really comprehensive approach to InDesign accessibility. Um, he's missing some, some compliance pieces at the end. But uh, he's great, and and if you need his contact information, feel free to reach out to us. He does kind of guest training for us as well sometimes, um, so happy to connect you. But those those would be the the places to start. And you've already touched on this, but uh, I guess somebody needs to somebody asked it again. Uh, would a dark background and light lettering be more accessible? Uh, no, it it could be. But you're you're needing to recognize that the structure is what's what's important, not the actual contrast itself. You will never be able to design for every single print disability. It's impossible. So that's why you know the the mechanism to make something accessible is the important part. You really need to focus on the structure of your content, the semantics of your content, how people are going to interact with that content, distribute it, rather than I can only put black text on a white background or white text on a black background or, you know, in our case, blue text on a back, uh, uh, black background. No, blue text on a white background. Um, you know, and, and don't panic about your content. Recognize how that content is presented and how it's going to be consumed and make the structural accessibility the fundamental thing that you're worried about. And, and good design is good design, right? I, I mean, we always go back to that, that philosophy of if it visually presents itself well on a page, then it's going to be inherently more accessible. If you put you know, faint text on a faint background, it's hard for everyone to read. That, even if you have 20-20 vision, that's going to be harder for someone to consume. Same thing with font sizes. We get asked that question all the time, uh, particularly with... Um, um, footnotes. Can we have six point font? Yes. Yes, you can. Provided that the document has been made accessible or the website has been made accessible and we can scale that font based on our, our structure. If you don't, it won't be accessible. So those are, those are the things that I would always keep in mind. Awesome. And I think we have one more question. Um, do you tailor training to groups based on the work they do? Yes, and it should be. Yeah. And, and that's a big part of the questions that should be asked. It's what's your workflow? What are the types of content that you're creating? Why would you, you take all of this time to learn you know, the, the, the in-depth fundamentals of accessibility if you're transactional with it? It's, I have this file, I do this file all the time, I know my InDesign skill, uh, or maybe you don't know your InDesign skill, and that's a big part of what you need to learn. But you've got to tailor the training, and, and that's why you know big group training for especially InDesign or, or complex content never works. 
it just doesn't. We limit our, our class sizes because as much as you think I'm a great designer and I know how to do things, you may have been taught at a different, uh, been taught the material a different way, and it's going to fly over the head of someone else next to you. Um, and and that's why tailoring it and having that pre-interview and setting up your course is going to be a critical step in in you being successful in making content accessible. Amazing. Uh, we have so many more questions, but that's all the time we have right now. Uh, but if you have any questions for Adam, I'm sure you can reach out to uh, Able Docs on their email. And I would like to thank Adam for presenting this webinar and for answering all of our questions. We really appreciate it, Adam. So thank you. It's my absolute pleasure. And yes, please email us at contact at abledocs.com, A-B-L-E-D-O-C-S. We will be happy to either set up a call or, or respond uh, if the question's easy or reach out to us on Twitter or LinkedIn. Always happy to, to have that conversation. And thanks so much for spending your lunch with us. Perfect. And the recording will be available for anybody who wants to watch it afterwards. Um, and before we sign off, a quick reminder that the RGD organizes regular free virtual events for our members. You can join us for tomorrow's webinar as our diverse panelists of recently certified RGDs break down their case study processes and answer questions about their experiences. And you can visit rg.ca slash webinars for a full list of upcoming events. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you all for your participation.